Warning, Kinda Murdery contains adult themes, explicit language, and descriptions of violence. It is not suitable for anyone, and we recommend you stop listening now. True crime with a dash of the paranormal, the garish, the strange, and the darkly comic. I'm Zevin Odelberg, host of Kinda Murdery, a podcast that's about more than just murder. It's my very own pocket dimension, home to a curated collection of bizarre and compelling stories, the unsolved, the unsettling, and the unbelievable. I cover it all, just so long as it's kinda murdery. Hey everybody, we're back with a brand new episode, and just like it says in the intro, I am Zevin Odelberg, and this is Kinda Murdery. Now, while the Daylight Cat Burglar, the story of Peppino and the Madonna Col Bambino, was a bit of a lighthearted departure comparatively for us, today we return with the darkest of the dark. A long standing cold case now solved. A story of kidnapping and murder most foul. So find your courage, and if you're ready, please join me as we uncover what truths we can and solve what mysteries we may. Kind of Murderies, Unspeakable, The Lion Sisters Tragedy, starts now. In the quiet, idyllic suburb of Kensington, Maryland, a story unfolds that would shatter the tranquility of a close-knit community. The Lion family, led by Father John, a familiar voice on WMAL radio, and his wife, Mary, seemed to epitomize the American dream. They had three children, an older son, Jay, who would later follow a path into law enforcement as a homicide detective, and two daughters, Catherine and Sheila. The family lived in a time when the phrase stranger danger hadn't yet infiltrated the collective consciousness. It was an era, as depicted in the Montgomery County Gazette, where the worries of the world seemed far removed from the day-to-day -day life of a suburban neighborhood. Children played freely outside, doors remained unlocked, and neighbors didn't just know each other, they looked out for one another's kids as if they were their own. In this seemingly safe environment, Lion Family's story takes a turn. It's a narrative that would not only challenge their lives, but also leave an indelible mark on the community's sense of security and togetherness. What unfolds is not just a mystery, but a stark reminder of the fragility of safety even in the most protected of environments. As we delve deeper, we piece together the clues, the moments leading up to the unthinkable, and the ripple effects that followed. Stay tuned as we unravel this gripping tale from Kensington, Maryland. In the heart of the Lyons family home, nestled in the peaceful suburb of Kensington, Maryland, we find two young girls, Sheila and Catherine Lyon. Sheila in the fifth grade and Catherine in the seventh weren't just any ordinary children, they were both honor roll students, which was of course a testament to their dedication and intelligence at such a young age. The girls' bedroom, a sanctuary of their interests and dreams, was adorned with the posters of John Denver and Kenny Loggins. These weren't merely decorations, of course, they were a symbol of the era and the innocence of childhood. These posters, icons of the times, watched over the girls as they played, studied, and dreamed. In this same room, the two sisters kept their piggy banks, a childhood staple where they saved their allowances and loose change. It's in these small everyday details that we find the essence of Sheila and Catherine's lives, filled with normalcy, aspirations, and the simple joys of being children. But as we delve deeper into their story, these images of innocence and normalcy set the stage for a narrative that would take a dramatic and unexpected turn. The piggy banks, the posters, the honor roll. All these elements form a backdrop to a mystery that would soon unfold, challenging the perceptions of safety and childhood in a community that believed itself to be secure from the dangers of the outside world. Stay tuned as we continue to unravel the layers of this captivating story. On the first day of their Easter vacation, a day brimming with the promise of spring and the carefree joy of childhood, Catherine and Sheila Lyon embarked on a seemingly mundane adventure, a short journey that countless kids their age might have undertaken. The destination? The nearby Wheaton Plaza Mall, now known as Westfield Wheaton, located just a half a mile from the safe harbor of their home. It was the kind of plan that sparkles in the eyes of children. 
an afternoon filled with the vibrant colors and festive spirit of the Easter exhibits, capped off with the delightful anticipation of a meal at the Orange Bowl pizza joint. This was not just a trip to the mall, it was an expedition into the world of independence, a rite of passage for two young girls stepping out into the world on their own. Leaving their home at around 11 a.m., the Lion sisters carried with them the trust and freedom bestowed upon them by their parents. They had a curfew, a simple agreement to return home by 4 p.m., a pact that reflected the normalcy and safety of their community. The plan, so ordinary in its inception, would soon take an extraordinary turn, weaving into the fabric of Kensington's history a story that would be told and retold each time with the same disbelief and heartache. As the clock ticks toward 4 p.m., we follow the path of Catherine and Sheila to Wheaton Plaza and piece together the moments, the decisions, the circumstances that transformed an ordinary day into an unspeakable tragedy and an enduring mystery. As the afternoon waned into the evening on that fateful first day of Easter vacation, a palpable sense of unease began to permeate the Lion household. Catherine and Sheila, who had ventured out to Wheaton Plaza with plans to return by 4 p.m., were nowhere to be found. Hours ticked by, each minute stretching longer than the last, until, with heavy hearts and a growing sense of dread, their parents made the call to the police at 7 p.m. What followed was a search of immense scale and urgency. The police, embodying a sense of determination and hope, combed through the landscape of Kensington and its surroundings with meticulous attention. They scoured through weeds and delved into every stand of trees, searching for any sign of the girls. Scuba divers were dispatched into the depths of ponds and storm sewers, exploring the unseen and overlooked in hopes of finding a clue. Every vacant house for miles around was examined, leaving no stone unturned in this desperate quest. The community, bound together by a shared sense of loss and determination, rallied around the Lion family. Neighbors, united in their concern, joined the search efforts, scouring the woods and streets. It wasn't just a search, it was a collective endeavor, a testament to the community's solidarity and compassion. The extensive search captured the attention of the media, casting a spotlight on the mystery of the missing Lion sisters. Hundreds of tips flooded in, each one a potential lead to unraveling this mystery. The story of Catherine and Sheila was no longer just a local concern. It had touched the hearts of people far and wide. But as time passed, the influx of tips began to dwindle. Hope, once a bright flame in the hearts of the Lyon family and the community, started to give way to the crushing weight of desperation. The ambiguity of the situation, the not knowing, took its toll, transforming the search into a roller coaster of emotions. It was a journey marked by the highs of hopeful leads and the lows of devastating dead ends. As the investigation into the disappearance of Catherine and Sheila Lyon intensified, the police began to piece together a timeline based on eyewitness accounts. Witnesses confirmed that the sisters were indeed at the mall around 1 p.m. on the day of their disappearance, placing them at the very location they had planned to visit. This was a crucial piece of information, narrowing down the window of time in which they went missing. Adding to the complexity of the case, a boy known to be a friend of Catherine and Sheila provided a potentially significant lead. He reported seeing the girls outside the Orange Bowl engaged in conversation with an unidentified man. The man, described as being in his 60s and dressed in a brown suit, carried with him a brown briefcase. Inside the briefcase, a tape recorder around which children were gathered, speaking into the microphone. This description painted a vivid picture of the man, but his identity and intentions remained shrouded in mystery. Approximately two weeks after the disappearance, a new lead emerged from Manassas, Virginia. A witness claimed to have seen two girls in the rear of a 1968 Ford station wagon, bound and gagged. This alarming report added a layer of urgency to the investigation. However, after thorough examination, the police labeled the lead as, quote, questionable, unquote. The uncertainty surrounding this sighting only added to the growing frustration and complexity of the case. The media coverage of the Lion sisters' disappearance reached a fever pitch. The story not only dominated the news, but also captured the public's imagination, leading to a barrage of calls from a range of individuals. Attention seekers, psychics, and even extortionists came forward, each offering their own theories, insights, or demands. This influx of information, while indicative of the widespread interest and concern for the girls, also posed a challenge for the police. They had to sift through a multitude of calls, separating potential leads from misleading or false information. In the midst of this media storm, the Lyon family and the community continued their agonizing wait for answers. Each new lead, each witness account brought with it a mix of hope and despair. 
The story of Catherine and Sheila had become more than a local case of missing children. It had evolved into a dizzying mystery, capturing the attention of a nation and highlighting the unpredictable nature of such investigations. Now, stay with us as we continue to unravel the twists and turns in the search for the Lion Sisters, a search marked by elusive clues and the unwavering determination to uncover the truth. In the harrowing weeks following the disappearance of Catherine and Sheila Lyon, their family's ordeal took a chilling turn. The Lyon household began receiving calls laced with the sinister undertones of extortion. Unidentified callers demanded ransom in exchange for the safe return of the girls. In one particularly distressing incident, the Lyon family was instructed to leave $10,000 inside a restroom at an Annapolis courthouse. The police, navigating the treacherous waters of a kidnapping case, directed the Lions to comply with the demand. In a strategic move, they placed only $101 in the briefcase, a sum just enough to elevate the crime to a federal level. However, this carefully laid trap did not lead to the resolution they hoped for. The ransom money left in the courthouse restroom remained untouched, an ominous sign that the path to finding the girls would be far from straightforward. Amidst all this turmoil, a week after the sisters' abduction, a new figure emerged in the unfolding mystery. Lloyd Welch, a young man of about 18 years old, entered the fray with a curious claim. He approached a security guard at Wheaton Plaza Shopping Mall, the last known location of Catherine and Sheila, and recounted a story that echoed earlier witness descriptions. Welch claimed that he too had been at the mall on the day the girls vanished and had seen a man with a tape recorder talking to the girls. But who was Lloyd Welch? A carnival worker by trade, Welch led a transient life, moving from town to town, embodying the archetype of a drifter. His background and itinerant lifestyle shrouded him in a cloak of mystery. When subjected to a lie detector test, Welch failed, casting further doubts on his reliability. Despite this failure, he was quickly dismissed as a suspect by the police, considered more of an unreliable witness than a person of interest. The introduction of Lloyd Welch into the investigation adds a layer of intrigue. His claims, although initially dismissed, linger in the background of the case, a reminder of the myriad faces and stories that intersect in a mystery as deep and confounding as the disappearance of the Lion Sisters. As we continue to piece together the narrative of this baffling case, each character and each lead takes us down a new path, each with its own twists and turns. The mystery surrounding the disappearance of Catherine and Sheila headed in a new direction with the emergence of a new lead one that brought a previously overlooked aspect of the case into sharp focus. A young girl, a friend of the Lion Sisters, came forward with a crucial observation. Her identity has been carefully protected over the years, a necessary measure due to the sensitive nature of the information she provided and the potential risks involved. The young witness offered a detailed description of a man she observed on the day of the sisters' disappearance. She painted the picture of an individual in raggedy clothing, a white male in his late teens or early 20s. This man bore distinctive marks, acne and scars on his left cheek, features that made him stand out in her memory. Her encounter with him was so unsettling that she felt compelled to confront him, an action that speaks volumes about the intensity of his gaze and the discomfort it caused. In a twist that would send ripples through the investigation, the police sketch created based on her description bore a striking resemblance to a mugshot of Lloyd Welch the same Lloyd Welch who had earlier approached a security guard at Wheaton Plaza with his account of the day the girls vanished. As the years passed and the case remained unsolved, a renewed push to find answers in 2014 brought Lloyd Welch back into the spotlight. By then, Welch had accumulated an extensive criminal record. Notably, in 1977, he was arrested in Montgomery County for burglary just eight blocks from Wheaton Plaza, adding another level of suspicion to his already questionable history. The plot thickens with the involvement of Henry Parker, a cousin of Lloyd Welch. In 2014, Parker made a chilling revelation to the police. He recounted a disturbing encounter with his cousin back in December 1975, mere months after the Lion sisters' disappearance. Parker described helping Welch remove two duffel bags from a house in Virginia. The details he provided were macabre. The bags emitted a smell reminiscent of death and were covered in red stains. Parker's account led police to a remote mountain area in Bedford County, Virginia, where he claimed the bags were disposed of in a fire. As we continue to explore this complex and heart-wrenching case, each new piece of information sheds light on the dark corners of the mystery. The involvement of Lloyd Welch, once dismissed as an unreliable witness, takes on new significance as we delve deeper into his past and his potential connection to the fate of the Lion Sisters.
In the tangled and tragic saga of Catherine and Sheila Lyon's disappearance, a critical development unfolded many years after the initial investigation. Lloyd Welch, once a peripheral figure in the case, emerged as a central suspect. His connection to the case evolved from initial dismissal to intense scrutiny, leading to a dramatic turn in 2015. Welch, whose past was marked by a series of criminal activities, became the focus of renewed investigative efforts. His criminal record, including a 1977 arrest in Montgomery County for burglary, placed him in the proximity to Wheaton Plaza around the time of the sisters' disappearance. This connection, once overlooked, gained new significance as detectives delved deeper into his background. As I've already mentioned, the breakthrough in the case came when Henry Parker, Welch's cousin, revealed his involvement in disposing of two duffel bags with Welch in December of 1975. Parker's account, which described the bags as emitting the smell of death and being stained with what appeared to be blood, pointed to a grim conclusion in the search for Catherine and Sheila. In 2015, Welch stood trial for the murder of the sisters. The weight of the evidence, coupled with the testimonies and leads that had accumulated over the years, led to a pivotal moment in the case. In a significant turn of events, Welch pled guilty to the murders, bringing a long-awaited, though somber, resolution to a mystery that had haunted the Lyon family, the Kensington community, and the public for decades. Welch's plea marked the end of a painful chapter in the Lyon sisters' case, providing answers to questions that had lingered for 40 years. And while it brought legal closure, the emotional and psychological impacts of the case continue to resonate with those affected by the tragedy. The story of Catherine and Sheila Lyon and the subsequent investigation and trial of Lloyd Welch remain a stark reminder of the complexities and challenges inherent in solving cold cases and the enduring pursuit of justice. The Lyon family, forever altered by the heartrending disappearance of Catherine and Sheila, has chosen a path of quiet resilience and privacy. Despite the widespread attention their case has attracted over the decades, they've maintained a dignified silence, emerging only rarely to address the public. On February 11, 2014, they broke their silence with a poignant statement, a rare window into their enduring grief and gratitude. The statement, issued nearly four decades after the fateful day their daughters vanished, reads, March 25th will mark 39 years since Catherine and Sheila were taken from our family. Throughout these years, our hopes for a resolution of this mystery have been sustained by the support and efforts of countless members of law enforcement, the news media, and the community. The fact that so many people still care about this case means a great deal to us. The statement, steeped in years of pain and perseverance, reflects not just a family's enduring heartache, but also their gratitude towards those who have never forgotten Catherine and Sheila. It acknowledges the tireless work of law enforcement, the role of the media in keeping the case alive, and the community's unwavering support. The Lyon family's words serve as a somber reminder of the impact such a tragedy has, not just on the immediate family, but on the broader community as well. As the case saw developments in eventual closure with the trial and conviction of Lloyd Welch, the Lyon family's statement remains a testament to their strength and the collective hope of a community that stood by them through an unimaginably difficult journey. Their statement, laden with both sorrow and gratitude, echoes through the years as a poignant reminder of the enduring human spirit in the face of violence and tragedy. The conclusion of the Lion Sisters case, marked by the sentencing of Lloyd Welch, brought a complex mixture of emotions to the fore. Welch received a 48-year sentence, a decision influenced by his age, and the fact that he was already serving a 10-year sentence for an unrelated case in Delaware. The sentencing of Lloyd Welch, though it could not undo the decades of pain and uncertainty faced by the Lyon family and the broader community, represented a form of closure for a case that had lingered in the public consciousness for far too long. The disappearance of Catherine and Sheila had a profound and lasting impact on the Lyon family's dynamics. In the wake of the tragedy, John Lyon transformed his grief into advocacy, becoming a victim's advocate in Montgomery County. He dedicated himself to counseling other families suffering from tragedy and loss, turning his personal heartbreak into a means of supporting others in their darkest hours. The story of Catherine and Sheila Lyon and the subsequent investigation and trial remain etched in the annals of Maryland's history. It's a tale of loss, perseverance, and the unyielding pursuit of justice, a story that continues to resonate with those who remember the Lyon sisters and the legacy they left behind. Thank you so much for being here. I'm Zevin Odelberg, and this has been Kinda Murdery. 
If you like the show, please subscribe, review, and tell your friends. You can find us on social media at Kinda Murdery or email at kindamurdery at gmail.com.